Matthew, look, as we were talking earlier, I'm super happy to have you on the podcast. You know, it's I have a lot of things to talk about, and those are topics I'm personally passionate about, you know, emerging technology, and that's something you specialize in. But before we get into the, the core, could you give us a brief introduction for the people that don't know you? Uh, who's Matthew Brenman? Yeah, sure. Who's Matthew Brennan? Okay. Um, <laughs> Matthew Brennan is someone who is known, I guess, for uh, covering Chinese internet innovation and Chinese technology. Uh, in particular, for many years, I covered WeChat, uh, which is the flagship product of Tencent, one of the largest internet companies in the world, and uh, the famous super app of China. And then recently, I've done a book now about uh, ByteDance, which is the up and coming big internet giant in China. And so people know me from that. Uh, and uh, that they're the company behind TikTok. We'll go into that later on. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, for many years, I did a conference in China. That's one of the largest digital marketing conferences. Uh, a lot of people know, know me from that. Uh, basically, you know, been in and around China for pretty much all of my adult life has been spent in China uh, since going there after university. And in a, you know, in a different lifetime, I was doing uh, ed tech, uh, we called it e-learning, building software products for the Chinese market uh, for K-12 education, English language learning um, software. Uh, that was really like sort of the first wave of software for, for most of the sort of uh, most most of the you know, outside of Beijing and Shanghai, all the sort of what we call tier two and tier three cities mm -hmm. across China. Um, so that was pretty wild times. So that was pretty interesting. Um, but yeah, I'm just really passionate about what's going on in China in terms of technology, in particular internet companies. And I'm really just trying mm -hmm. to be a Matthew Brennan. If we are saying I'm trying to be a bridge here, I'm trying to be like take. I speak Chinese, you know, I use the products. Uh, I, under, you know, I know people in the companies, I go to the events on the ground. And so I've got this sort of found myself, you know, as a, a you know, having all this knowledge and nuance that was sort of missing from the analysis uh, that a lot of people have around Chinese technology companies. And to be fair, it's, you know, it's understandable because you might read about Chinese uh, technology, but if you're outside China, you you don't use any of these apps, and they're all in mm -hmm. Chinese, and they all do these like crazy things, and there's all these like social e-commerce is happening, and mobile payments are happening, and yeah. all these crazy numbers and statistics, uh, and and China's so big that the companies, you know, so huge, right? But yet it's very difficult to grasp, you know, what really is going on and what's really driving this, and is and because. You know, a lot of it just gets way overhyped sometimes. And there's a lot of things, you know, just like in Silicon Valley, like people talk about things that aren't things or right. they get, you know, they think that this is the cause when actually that's nothing to do with it. It's all about something else. There's, there's, it's just the same in China. So um, that's uh, just trying to demystify it, I guess. That's actually interesting um, what you just mentioned, because you are right there. It seems like there's a curtain of information between what's happening in China and what's happening in the West. You know, I grew up all my life. I grew up in Lebanon, moved to Canada, and now I'm in Dubai. And the only things you hear about China is always through those large media channels. So I was wondering before we start talking about ByteDance and all the AI stuff and cool stuff, why do you think there's this curtain of information? Is it done uh, purposely or is it something that happens? There's a there's a signal loss between the translation and the different media outlets and everything. What happens exactly? This is a great question. It's a great question. People don't talk about this enough. Um, so there's a couple of things going on. I mean, there's a language barrier, right? Number one, that's probably the biggest is that uh, so about only a very small trickle of information gets translated into English that's actually produced in China, in Chinese, about, about these companies, about these products, about you know, internet trends and, and social media, et cetera. Um, so that's one. There's a cultural barrier, right? China's just mm -hmm. culturally very different from many other countries in the world. Um, there's an infrastructural barrier because there's actually only um, – three countries in the world that managed to escape the gravity of Silicon Valley through the last mm. um, you know, two decades, which is China, which built the Great Firewall, and that was a big part of it. But also, even before that, Chinese internet companies uh, were building products that were very successful in their local market. Um, the South Korea, uh, which mm -hmm. has you know, companies like Naver, Net, Netball, um, Netmarble, sorry. Uh, and then you have uh, Russia, 
which has its mm. own sort of search giants, its own social giants. These are the three companies that have local infrastructure. And when I mean infrastructure, I mean sort of search uh, and social networks and things like that, um, which are separate from Silicon Valley. And so once that infrastructure is swapped out, it means all of your reference points become mixed up and it becomes very difficult for you to actually work out what's going on. Uh, in China, for example, you can't reach people by email, right? So you cut all of the sort of email marketing tools and a whole full of like Salesforce and all that's built on like outbound reach for uh, B2B businesses, et cetera, and all of that stuff. It just doesn't work in China because most people don't use email on a daily basis. Emails in the market. I don't want to mislead you into thinking Chinese people don't use email. But the average Chinese, uh, e what they really use is, is WeChat. That, that's their inbox, right? They check WeChat wow. on an on a hourly basis. And if you want to reach them in the same way as you would do with, with email in the West, you've got to reach them in, in WeChat. But unfortunately, you know, WeChat works totally differently. So all of this sort of like, you can't just translate stuff over into China. And of course, all the company names are different. All the product names are different. And you never heard of them and you never use them. And so unless you really spend the time to understand it, it's very difficult to take away understandings from it. That's so uh, interesting. That's the reality. Do you think in a world of globalism where um, communication, where the communication between different nations results in the some positive of everything do you see this as uh, a benefit the fact that there's this curtain wall of information or do you think that we're going to be seeing more openness in terms of communication we're going to start seeing more collaborations in terms of uh, for example sometimes i've worked with people from uh, alibaba where i've had to order merchandise for my products and i, I was only able to do so because there was a point of contact with people there do you see these points of contact becoming more common as the world progresses in the next decade or two? Um, unfortunately, you know, I'm a little bit negative on this. I think that the, the splinter net, <laughs> if we are to use such a cheesy phrase, um, is a very real trend. And uh, I, I do see that there's a divergence um, in between the increasingly between China and, and, the, and the rest of the rest of the Internet. Uh, and I think this is happening. This is going to happen all over the world. Uh, you know, in, in India, they've banned all the Chinese apps. And so you don't have TikTok in that market. Um, you know, that's another, in Russia, LinkedIn's banned, right? You can't, you can't use mm -hmm. it in that market. Uh, that, those sort of things will become increasingly common, I believe. Uh, there's, there's just in the last year, especially with COVID, I think governments around the world have really um, come to realize it's been thrown in their face how important this infrastructure is. Uh, you know, internet services are a very real part of the economy. Before, you know, 15 years ago, I think, uh, you know, regulators and government officials, they knew it was important, but we could pretend to ourselves that this is a virtual world, right? Like that is online and it doesn't really affect that. Okay, there's e-commerce and there's social networks and things, but most of the economy is separate from that. It's real. Uh, we use email perhaps and that's about it, but email's open so it doesn't matter. Um, now, I think that that's just been blown out of the water, right? Like completely. Mm -hmm. uh, people, everyone knows that internet services are as fundamental to an economy as gas and electric and water. And so when you look at gas and electric and water, they're all heavily regulated. <laughs> and most of them are nationalized in many countries. Uh, I think it's inevitable that many internet services will become nationalized or semi-nationalized. That's kind of crazy. Uh, I, we haven't seen it yet, but I, I feel it's, it's absolutely going to happen. That's so interesting. That's so interesting. And that's actually, that's a, that, that transitions us actually to um, what I wanted to talk to you about uh, regarding ByteDance. You know, I started going through your book and I saw oh, in one of the prefaces of the book, there's a few graphics and images. And one of the graphs that really stood out to me is actually uh, a trend. It's a graph that shows the growth of ByteDance versus other Silicon Valley based companies. For example, Facebook, uh, Google, and there was ByteDance, maybe Tencent. And it's, it's basically the size of the, the, the organization in terms of employees. And ByteDance by far had the, the steepest exponential curve. So I was wondering, 
About that, what do you think fueled this exponential growth of ByteDance compared to those other uh, giants on the internet that are kind of on a linear trajectory right now? Fair to the other giants, to people, you know, Facebook, Google, etc. Um, you know, ByteDance is a younger company; it's only eight years old, right? So it's coming into a market that's ex, you know, uh, an order of magnitude larger than maybe two orders of magnitude larger than Google was uh, when they, when they started. Um, so gr- when you do have a killer product growing in that market, it's just a much larger market. So that's one of the reasons. But um, there's three core products with with ByteDance. And you've definitely heard of TikTok, everyone has, Uh, but the original version of TikTok is called Douyin. That's Mm -hmm. the Chinese sister app. Uh, And that's very similar to TikTok, but it also has many, many differences. Uh, And that came a year earlier that originally started in 2016 in in China. And then even before that, there was an app called Toteout, which is a news aggregator. And so the news aggregator is the uh, original flagship product of ByteDance. And it really speaks to what the core of the company is. If you do not understand Toteau, uh, you do not understand ByteDance. It's really uh, you know, the fundamental uh, starting point for why TikTok's so addictive. Why is it so popular? And why have they been able to grow it and scale it so fast? Uh, most of those answers lie um, when you look at, uh, in, and analyze the early years of the company uh, with Toteau. And just to give a brief thing, Toteau, you know, it's a household name in China. You've probably never heard, none of our listeners have probably never heard of it. Um, it's, you know, it's got hundreds of millions of daily active users. It's a, it's a news feed. It's a, it's a news aggregator. Uh, the simplest way to describe it is it's like the Facebook news feed without any of the social network or friends. It's just simply articles and videos, content. And uh, it's one of, you know, just before anything with TikTok, Uh, ByteDance was already one of the largest and most successful internet companies in China. And, you know, by by extension, one of the largest and most successful internet companies in the world, even though very few people knew about them outside China, simply based on Toteau. I didn't know that, for example. Yeah, I mean, there were definitely articles about them before Toteau. If you can go back and check the YC blog, the Y Combinator blog, uh, there are actually, uh, and there's an article on there written, I think probably in 2016 around then, uh, praising Toteau and just giving an explainer. And this is before anything with TikTok. So already in America, um, in the Silicon Valley, they they knew about uh, ByteDance and they knew that, okay, But actually, back then, nobody called it um, because there's there only one app that anyone cared about, which was which was that. Um, and you can see that uh, from those articles back then that actually it was already a thing uh, and definitely worth studying and knowing about. So you're saying that there's a common denominator between TikTok, Tuchao, and Duyin, which were basically the, the foundation of TikTok. And that's basically the algorithm. And that's something you dive deep into uh, into your book. What is it that you can tell us about the algorithm which really fueled this growth of TikTok and that made it, you know, one of the most killer apps out there today and one of the most addictive apps out there? You know, I'm in Dubai right now, um, staying over at my family's house, my uncle's and his family, and he has two teenage kids, one uh, 16-year-old daughter and one 14-year-old boy. And for them, TikTok is their social media, just like for me, it was MSN back 10 years ago. And just like it is now for Instagram, for me, for them, TikTok is where they meet people, they text people and they live stream with people. So what is it that (laughs) that fueled this curve? Yeah, there's two things there that I want to attack. One is definitely yeah, the algorithms, the recommendation engine. There's there's a lot to talk about there. But I actually find it really interesting that you mentioned the children, right, that you're talking about how for them, uh, TikTok is social media, right? It's very accessible for, for young people. And actually before TikTok, there was something called Musical.ly, which again, some listeners probably will know because it was actually pretty big um, was a there. couple of years ago now. You were on Musical.ly, you're a Musical.ly yeah, user. I was actually doing pretty day, well. Yeah? Okay. I used to do fitness Oh, content. really? Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, that's awesome. All right. Um, so, wow. Okay, that, that's cool because I was not a Musical.ly user. Uh, so when I wrote the book, I, that was one of the things I, I was really uh, struggled with for a little bit. 
Uh, I had to go and watch a bunch of YouTube videos and speak to people who were users to actually really make sure that it was was what I thought it was. Um, yeah, because musically was this kind of place that was very popular with preteens and teens mm -hmm. uh, for a couple of years in North America and Europe. And it never really broke out of that demographic in a big way. Uh, but it does speak to the fact that these preteens and teens were the early adopters of what eventually did become a completely mainstream experience, right, today with TikTok, where uh, it's just like any other social media in terms of the demographics. Um, but there was a period of time where people believed that this experience was something only really suitable for teenagers, right, or, or preteens, like 13s, 12-year-olds. And there was lots of influencers on there, like 12-year-old influencers, like 11-year-olds even, like uh, all these. Uh, and, and that was the only social media or like platform, content platform, where you would see that. You know, they, they wouldn't be able to do that on Instagram. They wouldn't be able to do that. on So I think that's really interesting because that speaks to the fact that you know, when we see these new forms of behavior happening online that are adopted first by, by, by very young people, uh, but not breaking through to older generations, then actually there could be something there that's much bigger than we think. Uh, mm -hmm. A really good example of this is like um, with voice technology. So I have like a smart speaker in my home in China. Uh, I try to use it all the time. And I find it's just, I can't use it. It's like, for me, it's just so useless. It's like, I can play music with it. Uh, I don't, you know, what do I, I ask the time. I can just look at my watch. Like I, I, I ask the weather. I can just look outside the window. Like, why do I need this smart speaker? Uh, but my daughter, she speaks to it like it's a person. She speaks to it all the time and in a very, very natural way. And uh, in a way that I wouldn't. So to me, that's like an indicator, like, Today, I can't use this technology very well, and I think it just adds a very minimal value to my life, but I think it has huge potential because I can see in the way that my daughter's using it that actually there is something here that, you know, I maybe because my habits are different and, and the way that I've grown up and used technology, uh, I've, I've got all these bad habits formed up, but she with her fresh eyes and her fresh mind you know just naturally in interacts with it in, in quite a different way so i am actually quite bullish on, on voice technology and yeah. voice interaction in the future it's not here today but i think it'll be absolutely huge uh when it does break through which may be five to ten years but we'll have to see anyway back to back to bike dance um with the second part which is about the recommendation algorithms yeah. um this is the core of the company. This is what makes Bite Dance Bite Dance, and and so um, from the very early days, this is this is what they specialized in. They're, they've got the team in Beijing of data scientists, algorithmic engineers, etc. And these guys are the best in China. Um, this is what their their core competency is, uh, and so it is, is having the the best content recommendation engine in in China, and perhaps in the world. I don't know. Um, having said that, you know Google is pretty impressive, and they've got you know uh, a lot of technology uh, in this space, and, they, and most of the big breakthroughs actually happened uh, from from them and from Silicon Valley, not not in China. Um, so why is People always ask me, you know, why is what makes TikTok so addictive? Why is their algorithm so good? And why can't Facebook copy this, et cetera? Um, well, I, one way to think about it, I think is a, a very useful way. Uh, let's just elaborate on something that we put in the book a little bit further. Um, it's just that when you're using TikTok, it's actually really perfect. The user experience is really, really good for training uh, mm. this algorithm into learning what you like and what you don't like. Um, the short form nature of the content and the user, the swipe up motion with the user experience uh, means that you get this very fast feedback loop and you're, you, you basically have to train the algorithm many times per minute. If you think about the average TikTok video, what, let's say it's 15 seconds, right? And so that means uh, in, in a minute uh, you can watch four of them, right? Like so, but let's say the av most of them you swipe through, and occasionally you'd watch one, yeah. and then you might watch one twice. So say, but the average is probably less than fifteen seconds, right? So let's say it's five per minute. Um, you've got five per minute. So in forty-five minutes, right? You can watch hundreds of them, right? Now in the same forty-five minutes on Netflix you would probably choose one episode and just watch that episode and you wouldn't interact with the screen once, right? You, you, after choosing the episode, you just sit back and watch. 
right? So you've stopped interacting with Netflix. So for that 45 minutes, they basically learn nothing about you. You have not trained the algorithm at all. But with TikTok, mm -hmm. you've trained, the, you've given them hundreds, maybe thousands of data points in that 45 minutes uh, of basically insights into your brain, into what you like and what you don't like. Because the options are basically when you have a, a video in front of you, it's a full screen experience, right? You can't be distracted by anything else. It's not a news feed where you can watch two or three pieces of content yeah. at the same time. It's only one piece of content and you either watch it, which means you like it, or you swipe, which means you don't. That are basically the two options. And right? there's other things you can do, but yeah. that, those are the two big ones, right? So you either say, I like or I don't like, and you're doing that multiple times every minute, right? So you're, you're just training it so fast. And YouTube would be somewhere in the middle, right? Where if you've got TikTok, where you're training the algorithm hundreds of times per minute, uh, Netflix, where you're doing it once every 45 minutes, uh, and YouTube's in the middle, maybe, maybe you might watch 10 YouTube videos in 45 minutes, let's say, or 20. Right. Um, so it's just an order of magnitude faster in terms of learning about you, right? And that's how people describe it when they use TikTok. They're like, suddenly, you know, I spoke to users about it and their experience and like, oh, suddenly it clicked and it just started showing me everything that I like. And I don't know what happened. It's magic. Uh, it's not magic. It, it, it's, it's just you're training it so fast is, is what it is. That's, that's the difference. Uh, and, and that would have been the same with Musical.ly, except the Musical.ly team really was a startup. The Musical.ly team was, uh, you know, a much smaller company and they just didn't have this huge team of data scientists, do, you know, working on this and they hadn't really cracked that. So Musical.ly was actually had the potential, but they just didn't have the technology to really maximize that. I know you've really broken down the algorithm. You've really studied that. What are the top five key metrics they look at on a video? Is it the watch time? Do they look at the... Do they look at the speed at which you swipe? Are all those small things, like what are the key metrics? Yeah, I'm hesitant to, to talk on this that much because it's constantly changing, right? So you're, mm. you're bound to be wrong, uh, <laughs> no matter what you say. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, from, from conversations, the basic, with, with ByteDance employees, the basics I know, watch completion rate, uh, it's a big one, uh, you know, it's obviously uh, likes and comments. It's the typical stuff. There's only so many interactions that you mm -hmm. can do. You know, commenting is a big one, uh, but sharing is actually really big. People don't, that's one of uh, people actually don't talk about that much, but uh, uh, is actually quite important. If you actually share the video out to another platform, uh, that's a really big, like, you would get a big bump if you do that is what I, uh, again, but like these, these weights on these different things are constantly changing and uh, Douyin and TikTok are slightly different now. You know, they've broken out TikTok uh, because of all the stuff that happened in America. You know, it is separate now from Douyin. They don't actually use the same servers. And so, uh, and it's going to uh -huh. start evolving into a different, you know, a di you know, a few years down the road, it could be completely different. Um, so, yeah, it's it's like all of these sort of black box algorithms. Like uh, we yeah. we've you know, I, I you do hear conflicting things. Like I've I've heard different things from different bite dance engineers as well that kind of didn't match up. And so, um, again, like it's uh, I don't I think it's it, it's it is constantly evolving. There are some sort of like everyone has their own theory as well, right? All the content yeah. creators are like, yeah, you do this and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, and there are definitely a lot of like dirty tricks that happen like in china there's a whole industry of people who have uh, you know do clip farms and uh and and like their their job is to basically trick the 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 doyin algorithm and uh, and that's what they do um but it's it's a constant game of cat and mouse that's why it's evolving all the time so mm -hmm. the tricks that work today won't work in six months so the the big Tech companies in Silicon Valley, they're all paying attention. They all see what's happening. You know, they've gotten comfortable. You know, Facebook has gotten a good 10 year streak of being the number one social media. Whenever there's a comp competition out there, just acquire them or copy them. Acquire Instagram, copy Snapchat. But now they're paying attention. YouTube's paying attention because at the end of the day, all those social medias are competing with each other. YouTube's competing with TikTok, even though it's a completely different format, they're competing with people's limited attention. You know, my cousin, my young cousin, 16 year old, she's on TikTok instead of being on YouTube. You see what I mean? You can't be on both. So if you could go, if you were hired as a consultant for Facebook, 
and YouTube. Let's say you go have a meeting with Mark Zuckerberg and Sundar Pichai. What would you recommend them in terms of tweaking the algorithm or introducing new features to their apps or those types of things for them to continue, uh, for them to stop losing market share to this big emerging startup, which is ByteDance? Um, yeah, so the lessons from China with, uh, you know, countering the rise of Douyin or countering the rise of TikTok, right? So you've got this big new player in town, it's sucking up attention, and what do you do? Um, I think both Facebook and Tencent, the equivalent competitor in China, uh, failed or have so far failed uh, in directly cloning TikTok. Um, the best countermeasure I've seen is actually from WeChat. And I was just thinking about it today. So WeChat, which is the one of the biggest, well, the biggest platform in China in terms of time spent still today, but it's predominantly a messaging experience, right? Mm -hmm. There's actually no direct equivalent to WeChat outside China uh, because it fulfills various functions. It's just a different layer of infrastructure. Um, it has, you know, payments are far more important. It does have newsfeed in there. Um, what's been suffering with the competition between the Chinese version of TikTok and WeChat, how has WeChat been affected and suffering? Well, it's just taken the tension away from their content ecosystem. So they have mm -hmm. a newsfeed in there and they have uh, something called official accounts, which are sort of like blogs um, where you can post content uh, as, as co um, something like Medium, I guess, would be so, or, or uh, Substack would be an equivalent mm -hmm. there. So, um, yeah, what, what it was just taking a lot of time away from their newsfeed products and, 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 and their Substack equivalent. So what do they do? Well, rather than building a version, a cl just a straight up clone, uh, they decided to say, okay, we're a, you know, what is our advantage here? You know, we can do something different. Well, the advantage is quite clearly the, 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 the social network, right? Is the, uh, is the, you, you've got all your friends on there and you, they know who your friends are and you've got all these relationships, uh, mm -hmm. which TikTok doesn't really have, right? TikTok's not a social network, right? Mm -hmm. This is, again, a sort of a, a misconception about TikTok. And, and to be fair to the company, they, they state that out, you know, out loud. They, they tell people that directly we're not a social network. Um, it's a content platform. It's like YouTube, right? Um, it's more about there are social interactions on there and most of them are revolved around commenting on posts. And that's quite different from messaging directly your friends, uh, which is possible uh, on, on TikTok and Douyin, but most people will not do that. Um, that the behavior tends to happen in messaging apps. Um, so what they said, okay, is like, we'll do a sort of video news feed, uh, a bit more like Instagram, but just purely videos with a scroll. So it's a, a slightly different user experience. Um, and we'll make it more social. So we'll make it more about, uh, you know, you just connecting and seeing content from your friends uh, and <clears throat> making it so that it's, uh, you know, as individuals, you can create con fostering an ecosystem where as an individual, you feel empowered to create content uh, yourself uh, and link linking that towards your social identity on WeChat. Um, it took them a while to get it going. Uh, but I think now it has actually started to work where this slightly different sort of social aspect around it of recommending content based on social network rather than uh, on, uh, on the recommendation algorithms um, does create a, a slightly differentiated experience. And, uh, and then they've been able to branch out from that into doing different tabs. And then one of those other tabs being a more sort of traditional TikTok experience. Uh, and so over time, they sort of trained their... Um, the users to go in and, and, and look at the sort of uh, social feed video, but then also start uh, competing more directly with TikTok on this sort of like recommendation uh, news uh, sort of feed of, of content, which is next to it. Um, so it's sort of going on a roundabout way to, to get to where they want. Right. It's like rather than just cloning it, we're just going to take our advantage and do something a little bit different. And then once we've got that rolling, then we can sort of like lead people into our direct clone, as it were. It's interesting. Um, yeah, it's an indirect way of competing. You sort of like get people to do something else and then drag them into something that, you, you know, you, all the time you wanted them to get here. Um, but to get them to here, rather than going direct, you have to go around um, yeah. is the way I think about it. 
Um, it's a little bit difficult to imagine if you don't like see the actual feed yourself, um, but it's um, it's very typical what WeChat does actually. They like to develop things in stages and often when they re release a new product on WeChat, it's not very obvious what they're trying to do. Um, the same thing with mini programs, which they, when they launched that, it wasn't clear in the early days what they were actually trying to achieve. And a lot of people said they were, wouldn't work. But, mm. you know, two years later, they've been a very big success. So, um, yeah, that's that's the WeChat way. But and so, you know, Facebook's gone completely the other way. They've just cloned it, right, and integrated it directly into Instagram so far, at least I, I haven't checked in the, in the last two months, but the last I heard of it, it's not working very well. I mean, is that your assessment on it? How is Reels? Do you, do you have any op opinions? That's a great, that's a great uh, question. I think I do because I've been, I, I do content for a living. And I think what Instagram succeeded at with Reels is holding its already existing client base in terms of young content creators that are on there because what we've seen is a rise of people that were doing content but that weren't getting the the traction and all of a sudden you see from a day to another one person that has a thousand followers has a hundred thousand followers and i feel that's something that tiktok has that sorry reels has succeeded at which is turning small content creators into content creators because that was what TikTok was, um, it was attractive about it is that you could become famous in between the brackets quickly on there. But now Instagram is also offering that for people that are interested in content. And you could find really good content on there. You know, a lot of, at first you used to see a lot of, you know, just reposts with the watermark, but now it's actually different. You're seeing original content. Um, and I'm personally liking the feature in the sense that I th think that it fits well within the app. So, but in terms of direct competition, we'll have to see the numbers. Yeah, I mean, that all makes sense because on every social platform, there's uh, at the beginning, there's an imbalance of supply and demand, right? There's, mm -hmm. there's more demand than there is content or quality content anyway. Mm -hmm. and, and then in the early days of TikTok, there's all these, all these stories of people, you know, getting millions of followers ridiculously with ridiculously bad content yeah. um, or just unprofessional because it was really like that in the early days. Uh, but that's not unique to TikTok. So for Facebook, that makes a lot of sense for them to try and do that. Um, you know, they're pushing it so hard. From what I've heard, you know, like uh, they're actually forcing brand pretty much not blackmailing or for, like, that's too strong a word, but like um, it's well known now that if you don't have reels on your Instagram account as a, as a brand, then your engagement is going to be pretty bad. Like mm -hmm. if you want to get good engagement, you have to do reels. So, and, and I think they've, uh, um, you know, let everybody know that. So, right. They're, 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 everyone's going to start oh, producing yeah. content because everyone had, you know, every brand has got an agency on a retainer that is, you know, being paid a lot to produce Instagram content. And so all of those agencies have to do it now. So um, you mentioned, you talked about WeChat and that's actually something that's pretty foreign for me and the rest of the Western world. Why do you call WeChat a super app? What about it? And that's kind of a, a term that you coined. What about it makes it super? I have conflicting feelings about the term <laughs> super app. I think it does mislead people. I think it's, uh, it is definitely very few people who use the term super app really understand what it means. Uh, and I think it means different things to different people. And my, uh, my take on this would be that there's really only one super app in my mind in, in China, really, and that's WeChat. Um, all the others are simply just bundling lots of different services into one interface, right? So if you go into Alipay, if you go into Meituan, uh, which is the world's largest food delivery platform, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can order food on there. Um, you can also get a loan. Uh, you can also buy plastic surgery. Uh, you know, you can go, there's all, you know, any, you can get a taxi, <laughs> Um, there's every, everything's there and it's just like a bunch of different pucks, right? It's different. It's, it's all these just different like icons, uh, for different services. So it's just aggregating what we call life services in China, uh, all into one interface. 
And that's cool. That makes sense from a user experience. I can go to Meituan and I know that any kind of delivery, uh, you know, if I want my uh, clothes dry cleaned or if I want to get flowers for my wife, et cetera, like it's going to be there. I know it's, I'm going to just have to find it, but it will be in there. Um, so that's, you know, that's the logic. It's a one-stop shop for, for any kind of service offline, um, connecting online to offline. Um, but that's, is that a super app? Uh, I, I think it's just a bunch of icons really, uh, in one interface. Uh, it's, there's nothing that special about it. Apart from that, you could say that Chinese users, are, uh, you know, like that kind of interface. They like that kind of aggregation. Whereas in the West, traditionally, uh, people like one app to do one service. Right, so I've got this app that does this thing, and I've got this app that mm -hmm. does that thing. And it's a const app constellation is uh, the way that some people describe it. Whereas perhaps super app is just to aggregate this whole bunch of apps. Um, so you open up one interface, and then all of these different services are, are combined together um, in this one uh, under this one company. Um, so Chinese users, yeah, do tend to prefer that more. But having said that, I think we see that in Southeast Asia uh, with Grab and Gojek. I think that's exactly what they're trying to do. Uh, and I imagine there's also examples to be found in India or, or South Korea. But um, what WeChat does is quite different from that. WeChat yeah. is actually what, what it's doing is kind of replacing the open web. Uh, so in China, on mobile, and mobile tends to be, you know, all, nearly all the traffic's on mob mobile, uh, desktop and laptop usage as a proportion of all internet traffic is much lower. And for most people, they only use their phone. Uh, I think that's actually quite common in many countries now around the world. Um, but what we also see is that browser usage is much lower in China than it is in other markets. There's some structural reasons for this with infrastructure. Uh, one of the big ones is that, you know, uh, there's no Google Play Store, right? Um, mm. Actually, in China, it's 80% Android market, um, but there's no Google Play in there, and there's no Google search bar on these Android devices. Um, all of the Google services are cut off. And so, actually, for Google, they're able to integrate search into many of these sort of basic Android experiences that you expect in other markets. That just doesn't exist in China. And the equivalent by do is actually quite weak on mobile. And so the search driven, um, you know, experience that we would be quite familiar with even on mobile and Western markets, that behavior gets fragmented across more of these different apps. And the apps in China tend to be walled gardens. They don't like to share data. They don't like to share information. And so you're the, you know, they don't, they don't allow their content to be crawled by search engines. So all of the good content in China, uh, it basically, you can't find it on Baidu. You can't find it on the equivalent of Google. You have to go into these apps and search for it within each app. So that's a big, big difference here in terms of how things work. Um, so that means the open web gets used much less. Um, and what people do is actually WeChat kind of replaces that in terms of WeChat replaces email uh, because it's where, as I talked about earlier, it's where people want to find you uh, if, if they want to, you know, contact you. Uh, people don't check the email boxes unless they're a white collar worker or if they're, um, you know, a, someone who speaks English and travels abroad. Yeah, they're going to check email for sure. Uh, but mm -hmm. that's a very small proportion of the population. Uh, and then uh, also WeChat uh, has newsfeed in there and it has mm -hmm. all, the mess all the group chats, Right, so group chats are actually very, very important in terms of sharing of information. WeChat's like the pipes through which information flows through the economy of China, essentially. Uh, and so it really replaces the role of the open web. And, and that's what makes it a super app is because everything you would expect to find on the open web in terms of all of these websites and services gets integrated into WeChat, but it's integrated in a very decentralized way. There's not, it's not just you open up WeChat and there's a whole bunch of buttons for different services, right? That's, that's what you get on Grab and Gojek and Meituan and Alipay and all of these other uh, lifestyle services app. No, on WeChat, they're all, they, all of these services are there, but they're integrated into group chats. They're integrated into one-on-one -on -one mm. conversations. 
They're integrated into the newsfeed. They're integrated into the search. They're integrated into like, yeah, there is a sort of list of services like the other ones as well. So they appear in all these other different places. Uh, and, and it's in a very decentralized fashion um, whereby you can find literally anything you want. Uh, but it's you'll find it in a, in a in a way that's usually in a very sort of messaging driven environment, uh, mm -hmm. and a very and so it makes it very social. It makes it very decentralized. Uh, so you know what does this mean as a business? Um, it means that essentially WeChat replaces the role of your website and your email list. So in the West, when you're a marketer, you think of you think of owned channels, right? So I want to build my own channels. I want to get my big you know, email list and I want to get SEO, right? I got to get some search traffic from Google, right? That's what a good marketer does because we believe that you, there's no middleman between that, right? You're, you're actually, you're getting that traffic from Google for free. You don't need to pay for it. And you can mail out your email list whenever you want and you don't pay for it. You might pay on MailChimp a little bit, but that's about it. So uh, the same logic here with WeChat as a marketer in China, WeChat is where I can have a direct, is the only place basically where I can have a direct link to the consumer because every consumer in China, you can be assured that they're on WeChat. And when you, if you can reach them in that inbox, they will respond, right? They'll have to see it. So if they yeah. follow your WeChat account, you can send them a message once every week Right, and they actually have to see that message in the same way that you can send them an email, and they have to see that email. Uh, and, and then, in terms of that that traffic, you own that traffic. Your mini program is like your website or your app. Uh, you own it, and you can distribute it through your groups. So many small businesses, like a small merchant in China, they will actually operate hundreds of WeChat groups, and uh, filled with their customers. And right. when they have a new product or a new announcement, then they will send out a message into each one of those WeChat groups. And for them, that's the equivalent of having a big email list, right? Because when you do that, the message pops up in each one of these, you know, 500 people in one group in, in WeChat. Um, so it's a very manual process and uh, it's very messy actually right. compared to email marketing and you know, doing Facebook ads, which is very data driven and it's very clean and you can scale it very well. It's not very manual. In China, it's very manual, it's very hands-on. Uh, but the same logic applies in that on WeChat, every marketer and every service is there uh, if, for everyone, but it's all there you know, uh, in, in a very totally decentralized way. And it's, uh, it's re marketers think of WeChat marketing as being like, the owned channel that they, yeah. that they have in the same way that Western marketers think about email and their website. So that's a very fundamental difference. It's, it's, it's really interesting how different the behavior are in the internet. I really like it. It's uh, like, I'm glad you gave those examples. You know, one thing I want to talk to you about is... Uh, sorry, I just want to land one point on that. Yes. You know, I think markets like India, it would be exactly the same, right? In India, WhatsApp would, would probably be the equivalent channel, right? If you actually want to reach Indian consumers, you're probably going to have to run, you know, hundreds of WhatsApp groups. And I imagine that's what Indian startups do. So it's not unique to China. I don't think it's actually, I think it's just, um, you know, what, what, is, what is a difference here is that there's, there are markets that mostly are called Western markets that went through web 1.0 and web 2.0 eras. And so the way that people use internet in those markets is different. And then there's other markets which are mobile first, where mm. most people started using internet from uh, 2011 and onwards, basically. And, and the, the behaviors in those markets are very, very different. Uh, okay, that makes sense. What's interesting about WeChat is that it's also a payment platform. So it's like, it's like, it's, it's literally everything. It's literally everything in your pocket. It's your computer, it's your laptop, it's your New York Times, it's your Instagram, and it's your Visa card. It's like everything in one platform. It can be, but to be honest, like most people don't use it that way. You know, I don't want to mislead you into thinking a Chinese just use WeChat for everything. You can use WeChat for everything. And due to the scale of it, um, all of the numbers are big on all of the services. Um, you know, all of, even the tiny service has got, you know, like hundreds of millions of, well, yeah. tens of millions of users, let's yeah. say. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, most, you know, Chinese still use apps, of course. And most people, when they want to buy something on a marketplace, they go to an Alibaba app. If they want a local service, they'll go to May 20 and Ping. Uh, and so mm -hmm. there is a big, you know, uh, app economy 
Uh, WeChat accounts for about one third of all internet traffic in China. And uh, most of that traffic is people messaging. You know, most mm-hmm. people use WeChat uh, for messaging and payments and some news feed occasionally, and that's about it. Uh, mm. and, and so, you know, that's, that's a pretty typical uh, experience of WeChat. All of these services are there and people do use them occasionally, um, but it's not the case that, oh, I just use WeChat and I don't use anything else. No, that, that's not how Chinese use the internet. Okay, okay. Um, I wanted to ask you, that's a pretty uh, interesting topic I'm very interested in myself, and it's about the topic of emerging technology. What are some of the technologies that have been born in China and that are leaking outside of China towards the uh, the Western market and emerging markets in Africa and Asia? And one example that I that comes up, and that's actually because something I've personally experienced myself being in the UAE for the past two weeks, is that UAE is pretty. They have a pretty high penetration of 5G technology in uh, in the city. And that's in part because they, uh, the, the, how do you say, the, the, the main carrier of 5G technology is actually from Huawei. You know, regardless of what you think of it, the, the, the innovation that's been happening in China is leaking in other markets. So what are some other uh, trends that are happening in this specific topic? Yeah, so, I mean, 5G is a big one. Uh, you know, two years ago, I would have said TikTok, right? I think that would have been the, the big breakout that I, I would I would have told everyone is coming and, and did come eventually. Um, there's nothing that's really exciting me right now. Like right now, this year, the in the last six months, at least, the, the big hot thing has been uh, community group buy, uh, which is a, mm. an e-commerce model, uh, where which works particularly well for uh, things like fresh produce, so fruit and vegetables and meat and things like that, where you organize for it to be delivered into one person in a housing community, and then they they do the last mile delivery to everyone else and collect all the payments. So it's not really a technology, it's a business model innovation. Uh, so that's been the, the thing that um, the giants have been Well, most of the headlines have been written, I think, of of the new thing. Obviously, there was bike sharing a few years ago. That was a really interesting one uh, that didn't, that still is around in China, actually. Um, uh, The thing is, the model um, wasn't as successful as people hoped it would be, but it does work, actually, uh, in a roundabout way. Um, But we didn't, we saw that that came into Western markets through scooters, uh, you know, the Mm. e scooter uh, bike uh, thing. Um, so every few years, there has been this sort of wave of new things coming out of China. Um, but right now, I feel we're in a lull. Uh, 5G is not, um, right now, the use cases for 5G are pretty few and far between. The, the actual okay. realistic and practical use cases of 5G for you and me today. I've got 5G on my phone, right? I've had 5G for a year now. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, it's nice. Um, it's fast. Um, you know, video does stream when you're in a taxi, right? Like you doesn't, you can, you can do a video call with like, you know, 11 people, whatever. And it, it will be perfect. Okay. Um, if you're down to, in, you're in downtown Shanghai and you're in a taxi. Um, so that's nice, but practically 4g was already streaming most things pretty well. So it doesn't make that big of a difference. Um, but you no, know, things will come along. You know, we the pipes get bigger for information, and then we mm-hmm. fill those pipes with information. That's that's how it's always been. So <laughs> uh, we'll get there. And but the way that we fill the pipes, you know, is is not obvious, right? When when we went from 3G to 4G, it wasn't obvious that uh, TikTok. You know, TikTok can't happen with 3G, right? It basically can't happen. Right. Uh, you have to be under Wi-Fi Wi-Fi conditions for TikTok to actually uh, to stream and have a good experience. Um, once you go outside of Wi-Fi, it wouldn't work. And that's actually pretty fundamental because TikTok, one of the big breakthroughs is the barrier to content creation is lower because you can just take out your phone wherever you are outside and, and shoot a video and upload it straight away. Mm. Uh, so that's quite different from YouTube era, right? Where YouTube, where you're using editing software and you're doing it on a laptop typically, right? So that was one of the big fundamental changes that needed to happen for TikTok to break through. Uh, you know, 5G, there'll be something there that, you know, is not possible with 4G, but we, it's very difficult to predict what that is right today. Yeah. Um, we, you know, I wouldn't have predicted that Snapchat and TikTok would have been the things that uh, came about because of 4G. So um, 
Yeah, I, I don't think there's anything that's really, you know, grabbed me right now. Uh, obviously, right now, everyone's today, uh, you know, everyone's talking about Clubhouse uh, yeah. being the, the big new thing uh, that's really, really breaking out in terms of new social platforms. Uh, in China, there's a lot of social e-commerce behavior uh, that's been, uh, this term social e-commerce has become a, a thing. And um, certainly, there's a much wider variety of experiences online through which you can purchase um, products, whether that's live streaming or whether that's news feeds um, or whether that's, you know, all kinds of stuff that you can basically, every platform you can buy stuff on. And e-commerce is just a much more, um, a much larger part of the pie in terms of internet services in China. So um, that means that when we see behaviors around e-commerce, uh, usually China is going to be one of the first places you see those new forms of e-commerce come out. Uh, and so some people have been talking this year about live stream a lot, mm. right? So e-commerce live stream has been a really big topic in China. Personally, I, I'm not so convinced on it. I think it's it's definitely, you know, something's there, but I don't think it's a huge thing. Like uh, it's been overhyped uh, in my uh -huh. opinion. Uh, so we have to see. So, but definitely a live stream e-commerce was going to be, um, should become much bigger in other markets around the world. It's been very big in China for the last 12 months. Uh, community group buy, I don't think is going to, I think it's going to stay in China uh, because that relies on sort of cultural and logistical infrastructure that we don't see in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. Uh, before we transition out of this, I have a few questions that were asked by the worldwide engineering community that I'd love to just throw at you when uh, they're usually quick. Uh, so how does that sound? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> that sounds like so our, Yeah. <laughs> so our first question is by Prathiban, and it kind of hits on what we were talking about earlier, but his question is, what do you think is the next industry AI will have a significant impact on? Uh, I'm not, oof, so many. I mean, like, uh, geez. I mean, the big one will be health, hopefully. Okay. Uh, I think we've really still have yet to see AI make a really big impact in health, right? But the potential is absolutely there. And it's quite exciting, actually, to think about it, that healthcare could be really, really much, much better in terms of diagnostics of, of, of things early, uh, things like cancer or some other, you know, other diseases that uh, can be identified now with some accuracy and, and you know, that can be drastically mm -hmm. improved. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I'm, I personally, I feel it's quite, you know, as I'm getting older, I feel like <laughs> that's probably a good thing. Um, but, you know, uh, so that yeah, definitely that's one. Education, you know, ByteDance, the company we talked about mostly today, um, is big on uh, education. So uh, mm. that's something that the founder, Zhang Yimin, is very passionate about. And there is also potential uh, for AI uh, to revolutionize education. When you think about what ByteDance does is they simply, at the end of the day, what TikTok is and all the other big platforms is that they personalize content uh, based on the interactions with the user. And actually that logic can also apply to a course curriculum for education, right? That the mm. personalization of a course, um, you know, should be, it should be, each course could be personalized for each student uh, much more than it is today. And that could lead to uh, a drastically improved educational experience. Uh, I'm definitely, uh, you know, people have talked about this for a while now. This is not anything new, um, but ByteDance is one of the best companies in the world for doing this kind of thing. And so if anyone is going to make a sort of fundamental breakthrough in this area, uh, they stand as good a chance as anyone. Uh, the, the founder is so passionate about this area. You know, it's like, it's really one of the things that they've put a lot of uh, money and time and people behind in the last, uh, I would say, two years now. 
Um, and they've, they've acquired a lot of startups in China around this area. Mm. They're starting to release products, uh, things for K-12 in particular. When I use TikTok in China, I'm always seeing adverts for their K-12 products because I've got a daughter who's five years old. So they're trying to sell me all of their courses uh, that they have now. So, um, yeah, that, you know, it's really quite, uh, it's a long-term vision for them. And I think that I'm, I'm excited about that as well. I think like education today okay. has so many problems and uh, we really need to apply some technology to what that's interesting you mentioned that by the way um, how once you have an established algorithm you can literally just scale it horizontally and apply it to different industries you know the exact same algorithm that's used to recommend entertaining content on TikTok can be used to recommend you uh, what your next meal is going to be on uber eats or what the next movie you're going to eat or who's the next uh, person you're going to meet on tinder you know, all those different apps, it's the same algorithm, just killed horizontally. Well, I don't, <laughs> I don't I mislead people to think it's the same algorithm, right? But it needs to be the same system. Usually like, you know, TikTok's, you know, not one algorithm, it's hundreds, right? But like, yeah. um, it's, yeah, I mean, that is a, a lot of people are scared by that, right? A lot of people are afraid of that kind of future, that um, recommendation could replace free will uh, to mm. some degree. I think there's a philosophical uh, questions to be asked there. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you know, AI seems a scary topic when you talk about it like AI and uh, machine learning and robots. Uh, it seems much less scary when you talk about it as like applied statistics and right. just, you know, basically using statistics to work out the highest probability of something being a good fit. Um, which we basically, as even as humans, we do in our normal lives. You know, it's just being logical, essentially. Um, but to a to a level that a human could never do, right? It's, it, I think we've sort of lost control uh, over like understanding how a lot of this works. Um, so that's that's the thing that people are concerned about. So the next question is by Alex Yoon. Have you personally experienced the overwork culture in China? Oh yeah, 996. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like I have back in the day. Yes, I, I did uh, at some point, but I, you know, I was a very willing participant in it. I feel that when I was doing, making software in China, that I was a bit, you know, during that part of my life, I would definitely classify myself as a workaholic. Um, mm -hmm. And, but I was loved what I was doing. So it was, it was fine. And I felt a real sense of accomplishment uh, in, in achieving what we achieved. Um, yeah, 996 is definitely still in China, still around, and most people don't like it. I think there's definitely a, um, I don't think it's a good thing, to be honest. I, I feel okay. it's like um, it's it's not a good aspect of, of Chinese uh, internet uh, industries, uh, culture. People do burn out. Um, it is a little bit silly, you know, but the competition and what's driving it is the competition. I mean, uh, mm. people... If, if you can't just have one company stopping doing this because they're just, everyone's going to beat them. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the speed at which they iterate products is you just don't see it in Silicon Valley. You don't see it in other markets, maybe South Korea perhaps, but like uh, it's just on a different level. Uh, the expectations um, it's, you know, if you don't answer a message within, you know, a, 10 minutes or something then your boss is like what's up like yeah you know uh, uh, at the weekend <laughs> there's, there's, there's there's very little sense of uh, uh private time you know the, these people in the in the chinese internet industry they accept this because the pay is good right relatively to other markets in china if you're working in the internet industry as an engineer um, or operation staff um, these are typically well-paid jobs and the best, you know, um, if you're working at a prestigious company, it's also something that, uh, you know, has, has prestige and your parents and family will be, you know, quite happy that you're working for uh, Alibaba or you're working for Tencent. Um, right. and, and so they accept it based on the fact that, you know, everyone knows that in, by the time you reach 30 or 35, you, you, you basically out. It's like being in the army, right? I think is how people look at it in China. It's like you're you're a soldier on the front line fighting this 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 war on the internet uh, against these other companies. And like a soldier, you know, is is seriously intense. 
and crazy even sometimes. Uh, but you know, you can't do it all your life. By the time you're in your thirties, you know, you, you, you're, you're burned out and you need to, you need to get out. But hopefully right. by the time you've reached your thirties, um, your company's IPO'd and you've got like crazy, you know, you're, you're already rich or, yeah. you know, if it's a company like Alibaba, you've got massive stock options now and you basically don't need to, you know, you can retire at 32 or whatever, something like that. You know, that's the dream. That's why they're doing it. Uh, because as young Chinese, you know, if you're a young engineer in China, you, you know, you've got to get a house. Uh, yeah. you got in it, because as a man, uh, if you don't have a house, you can't basically can't get married. Like that's the way the culture works, right? Like no woman's going to marry you in China. Uh, well, some will, but like traditionally that is the culture right. buying a house in Shanghai. Oh my God. It's ridiculously expensive. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like New York, right? It's just like, you're, you're really looking at sort of like global housing prices here. Yeah. Um, and, and so imagine trying to save up to buy an apartment in London or New York, right? It's, it's uh, really intimidating these days. Cool. And final question. This one's by Mark. What percent of the internet is owned by China? So in a sense, what, uh, what's the uh, market share of Chinese internet globally? Depends how you measure it, I guess. I mean, there's that, there's uh, McKinsey last year put out a report and they said like basically China e-commerce GMV, I think is basically the same, is as large as the 10 other largest markets in the world combined, right? So that's, you know, that's obviously America being number two, but then you've got like UK, Japan, Germany, you know, you go down the list in the next 10, yeah. and China's bigger than all of them combined. Um, but like I said, as I said earlier, you know, uh, e-commerce um, in the Chinese internet uh, services pie, uh, e-commerce is much larger than it is in other markets. In Silicon Valley, uh, the big giants went for the advertisement model, right? So Google's revenue is advertising, Facebook's revenue is advertising, Snapchat's advertising, right? So advertising is actually makes a lot of sense for them because they're global uh, products and right. uh, they have user base and they need to monetize in uh, Lebanon. They need to monetize in Brazil. Uh, and how do you do that? Well, advertising's the, the answer. Um, so for them, that makes sense. Whereas in China, e-commerce makes more sense because e-commerce, um, you've got su you've got the world's best logistics, right? You can mm -hmm. ship a package from Beijing to Guangzhou, right? That's from one end of China to the other for like a dollar. Uh, wow. And it will get there in like two days uh, or three days. Like it's so fast and reliable and people don't steal, right? There's, no, there's very little shrinkage rate, low shrinkage rates on e-commerce in China. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and there's these, all these pickup points and everyone lives in apartment blocks. So you can deliver at the bottom of the apartment block building and everyone will come down and pick it up when they go up every day. So distribution so much easier than America or other markets. Yeah. Um, so there's all these factors why e-commerce is, is more important in China and is so much more developed. Um, so that's why you see that 10 to one ratio for, for China. Um, in terms of like... Um, in, I, I don't know if uh, no other statistics come to mind in terms of like internet users, uh, in terms of mobile payments, right? It's just off the scale as well. I mean, in terms of yeah. like uh, people buying stuff on their phone, using their phones to uh, make transactions, uh, it's just, it's even more than uh, e commerce. It's just way off the scale. Um, but in terms of actual internet traffic, I'm not sure anymore, actually, uh, especially because India has been growing so fast in the last few years yeah. uh, that probably any data that we saw uh, from even two years ago would be out of date on that. Yeah, um, you're right. Yeah, it, it depends how you measure it. Yeah, no, it makes sense. So, Matthew, you have two big things happening. You have your podcast and you have your book. Where can people find bo out about both of them? Oh, on the podcast, I, we haven't done an episode for ages, so I wouldn't say really? that's a thing anymore. We've got that on hold. We might come back to it. Um, yeah, because my co-host, John, went to work for another media, so he, he, he switched jobs. And you know, I, don't, yeah, I feel like it was our, our podcast, and because he works for another media now, you know, there's, it's obviously not appropriate for him to do, even mm. though there's, no, there's no, nothing bad. They didn't leave on bad terms or anything like that. So just simply because of that. Um, but... Um, yeah, I am thinking about picking it up again because we have definitely got lots of followers on that, on that podcast. Um, but uh, the book has been, uh, yeah, a big thing over the last three months. That's gone really well. Uh, the 
book about TikTok and ByteDance Attention Factory. You can find it on Amazon. It's on Kindle. Uh, it's on uh, paperback. Uh, you've got a copy. Uh, and, you know, that's done quite well. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's that's uh, that's actually done really well, and uh, it's like the only book about TikTok. It's the only book about bite dance so, around right now. So it's got a unique positioning, and many of the things we talked about in the thing, we're just really touching upon it, and we go much deeper in the book and just give all the backstory about you know how did we get to TikTok and why was it bite dance to do this and all of these questions. Matthew, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It's my pleasure, Liam. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Bye-bye, everyone.